Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And we are very much again in risk on. There hasn't been a lot uh, to say about the bonds, but we will run through them very quickly. And then we will have a look at uh, the risk assets because a lot of things are happening in risk assets that are very interesting. And I will uh, go in into detail in those because that is where all the movement is likely to be in the next several months. The yield curve uh, in the US has basically achieved all its objectives. It is now in a period of correction which will last for as long as the Fed says so. Of course we have the Fed meeting this week and that's going to be interesting. My personal take is that they're not going to be as uh, bearish as people uh, think they will be for, uh, for bonds, uh, i.e. they will not be as hawkish as people expect. Uh, that to me indicates a period of stability in the yield curve until the economy, the real economy, does something one way or another. I thought the CPI figures on Friday were nothing special. I think we are probably at peak inflation. Um, and that uh, is going to, uh, to me, stabilize the yield curve at these levels. As long as two stands don't go below 75 and close a week below 75, ignore this bar, this is a false print. Uh, in that case, I see nothing much from the US curve driving asset prices. The same can be said for every other part of the yield curve. Fives 30s reverse from this very important level around 56. To me, we are going to be doing something like this uh, until we turn the moving average. And that at some stage will indicate that we are going towards a recessionary period. Um, not yet, not for a long time yet. Um, so this, this is like six months worth of action. We will see. I, I really don't think that 530s can uh, flatten anymore. I've been wrong on 530s since about here. Um, but on the other hand, you know, having caught most of this, uh, this extra period is really, to me, not all that significant. If we look at uh, fives, tens, this is important because we are now uh, at almost flat. You know, what is this? 23 basis points. And basically, we've returned uh, where we were in 2020. So really, we spent two years going nowhere in uh, in fives, tens. The fact that the yield curve is getting so flat uh, in these uh, in these areas tells me that <clears throat> there is very little likelihood of the Fed being more uh, uh, more hawkish than people expect. That is what the yield curve is saying. The yield curve is saying that we are the terminal rates are somewhere between one and a half and two percent, and that really we are not going to move very far from that level. Um, if we have a look even at tens, thirties, uh, that's coming back. Uh, to me, this is the kind of equilibrium point for tens, thirties around the fifty basis points mark. <clears throat> Anything much below that is is really too far ahead of the game. I really don't see why people should be paying up for 30 year notes uh, from now on un unless we start going into a recessionary period. And really, there is very little sign of that. Uh, and there will be very little sign of that for quite a long time. So having said that about the yield curve, let's have a look at the individual tenures and what that implies. I think the two year note, every time it gets to levels like this, which is like 53 basis points, is going to bounce up towards 90 to 100 basis points. This kind of area to me is almost unavoidable. 
uh, this is going to be something like 90 basis points and I think we will be there sometime towards the uh, first quarter in the middle of the first quarter of uh, of next year the economy is strong uh, inflation is above target but I think it's past the peak but I don't think the Fed has any choice but to uh, at some stage do at least between two and three rate hikes next year that's going to take us somewhere around the 90 to 100 basis points mark the five-year note has basically been around its 116 117 level for weeks and weeks and weeks i mean basically the whole quarter uh, you know, give or take five basis points either side. I think this kind of stability is going to continue. Uh, but while we slowly go up towards this 140, 150 basis point area, um, I really don't see any pressure on the five year note to uh, go down. I think all these dips are buys for this 150 to 160 area. Uh, and really the same can be said for the 10 year note. We have been in a huge, you know, what is this, 30, 40 basis points, let's call it 40 to 50 basis point range for basically the best part of the year. I think this continues with pressure towards 170, 180, 190. Um, simply because the economy is strong and the Fed is in the, I, will, I won't say a tightening mode, they certainly will speed up their level of, uh, uh, of, of tapering and they certainly will hike at least twice next year. Um, that does not take us much above this 180 area. But the direction of travel to me is... Uh, it's quite certain you buy the dips for moves to 180 to 190 basis points. And the 30s, I think they have shot their bolt. Um, I think they will now basically uh, trade somewhere around two to two, 210 to 220. That is going to be the, your natural shape of the yield curve, a terminal rate of around 2% in uh, in 30-year notes um, and a shorter end around 100 basis points with a relatively flat sloping yield curve of 100 basis points in the US that is neither recessionary nor inflationary and I think the Fed will get there. Um, to me that indicates a very moderate um, upward pressure in asset prices for the longer term. What is interesting about the differential between the US and Germany is that it basically keeps on trading 181, 182 basis points. Um, the fact that it keeps on returning to this tells me that the umbilical cord has yet to be cut. Um, and that to me means that asset price, I mean, bond prices in Germany will very much uh, follow bond prices in the US. We have amazing definition now in, uh, in the twos in Germany. Basically, you can see the levels we have here minus 64 and here we have minus 78 and this is basically the range that we are in so basically a 14 basis point range up and down up and down we go the day we start breaking these levels again on a weekly basis i think we're going to go a lot higher uh, that is going to be the uh, and you can see if i zoom out uh, so the the stability in twos uh, at some point i'm pretty sure is going to be smashed uh, and we're going to have one of these on the upside uh, simply because the twos in the states at some stage are going to go another 50 60 basis points and that's going to be reflected in germany as well 
But if we have a look at what the fives and the tens are doing in Germany, the answer is basically not very much. The levels are really holding very well. Around 64 basis points is the bottom. Uh, and I'm sure that these again will come up to this kind of level and at least fill this gap that we have up here over the course of the next three months or so. So I keep on playing the uh, the fives and the tens from the short side um, and it seems to be working. Um, so, but I, I'm only going in and out because I don't think there's um, a, a big move happening uh, as we speak. This is not the time, you know, this is probably not the time of year unless the Fed does something that we're going to get a very strong move in bonds either way. Um, I, as I, as I told you, I don't, I don't expect the Fed to be as hawkish as most people uh, think this time around, and therefore I'm not playing bonds at the moment. Uh, but to me, the pressure is all going to be uh, to the upside. This is the Bund. And at some stage, I'm really looking for it to break even this uh, minus 0.6 kind of level and go to par. The French bond is the clearest, really. Let's get rid of that. It, it, it is very much trading within very defined trading ranges. Should it ever fall down to minus 10, I will definitely put on a decent sized position because I'm pretty sure that at some stage next year it trades in the 30s. So that is all that can be said. I'm, you know, in summary, the US yield curve has done everything that I expected it to do and much more at the longer end. Uh, it is now in a period of probably correction to that uh, too much flattening. Uh, what does that mean? That means that the Fed is going to be uh, reasonably uh, hawkish, but nowhere near as definitively hawkish as a lot of people are looking for them to be. I think the, uh, the Fed is going to be uh, disappoint the absolute, you know, the hawkish, the, the most hawkish people. <coughs> what is, <coughs> excuse me, what is that going to do? That is going to disappoint bonds in a way, and I don't see a very good week for 30 year bonds next week. Uh, and it's slightly going to steepen the yield curve, but only give it a better level from which to flatten again. So two stands when they go back into the 90s, if they go back into the 90s, they're going to find it very hard because two stands at some stage next year will trade 40, 50 basis points. The flattening is all going to be at the front end, but that is going to push up longer term rates, both in uh, the US and in uh, Germany stroke EU. So to me, next year will be a year of maybe slightly steepening yield curve. Uh, and that, you know, but, but it's all going to be very much contained. The fact that uh, 30 year bonds go up uh, 10, 15, 20 basis points over the course of three months is just not enough to influence risk prices. That period of stability in, uh, you know, around 182 in the differential between Germany and the US is being reflected in the dollar. Nothing much is happening in the dollar. Some people are getting disappointed in it and so on. And I've just told you that I don't think the Fed is going to be as hawkish as a lot of hawks think. You know, that is likely to get them to sell in a kind of A, B, C move back down to 9507. But I think that as long as this 9507 is not taken out by a million miles, that will only produce a better base for us to break. 9647 on a large this daily chart has been a very, very good 
resistance level for months and months and months. And that is why it's, uh, you know, it's boldened. It's, it's basically, if you look backwards for weeks and weeks and weeks and years and years and years, it's always been a very significant uh, swing level or resistance level. Uh, I'm really not surprised that we cannot break it yet in front of the Fed. And I really wouldn't be surprised to see a retest of 9507 after the Fed and then slowly, slowly a bounce into year end, which take us, takes us to the next resistance level, which is in the weeklies, uh, which is 98.54. That is my ultimate, uh, you know, sort of uh, target for DXY. Uh, and after that, a period of stability. Uh, I don't think the Fed, what is driving uh, the dollar? I, th I believe that it's definitely not interest rate differentials. What I believe is demand for US dollar assets. Um, we will go into the uh, risk assets uh, a bit later, but it, it just is unending. There is nothing... It just keeps on. Uh, it just keeps on happening. People are keep on buying U.S. dollar assets, and there is reason in their madness. What does this imply for Euro USD? Well, as you can see on the weeklies, all the moving averages are now firmly on the downside, including the 200 period one. Um, on the dailies, we have very much the same kind of situation and nothing good happens when this situation is in play. Um, you know, any kind of uh, move back up to this uh, 114.80, 115 area, I think is going to get sold very hard. Um, and the initial move could easily happen uh, on a disappointment uh, for Fed Hawks. That will be the level, uh, you know, here it is, 115.34. Anywhere between 114.35 and 115.34 is a level that I will be buying put spreads in Euro USD. The picture in gold really has not changed at all. Um, I just can't get bullish of it. Um, it, it basically keeps on trading uh, 1,764 um, and not going uh, anywhere much away from it. Uh, it. What do I expect for next week? Maybe a little bit of, um, um, of, of a bounce, but it's going to be pathetic and it's going to get sold again. Uh, from 1830, unless it closes the week above 1830, I will be looking for actually a break down in gold. Um, I just don't see inflation as uh, that much of a big deal. I really can't get excited uh, about an upward potential of gold until we get into the, uh, you know, the around 1700 or even break these levels and uh, get down to 1630s. Uh, that to me is the level where gold has value. Um, it, here I just, you know, it, it's just nothing. I think we are past peak inflation. I, I think gold has got it right all year. Uh, saying that we are uh, at some stage at peak inflation and basically it's been in a small downtrend all year and only when people have given up on this gold bullishness will we be ready to, for the next leg up. Um, to me at the moment uh, gold is really not a hedge against anything. Well you know, this chart of DBC over GLD is really saying that at some stage, you know, it, it'll go down towards this 7, 638 area. And only there do we have value in gold. And we can look for a sizable move up back to something like this, back to 980. Um, to me... DBC is a uh, much better hedge. 
still. Uh, we, we've, you know, everybody got bearish at 1950 and the market bounced nicely. Um, are we going to go straight back up? You know, I, I doubt it very much. I think we're going to remain in a range with somewhere around this 21 area being the top. I don't think um, we, we, I think we're in a period of consolidation now. Um, and DBC to me is, is still the better hedge against, um, um, against inflation. Uh, I, as I said, I think we're probably past peak inflation, but that the, the economy is strong. There's very little reason for the energy sector to get dumped. Uh, and as a result, I think that DBC is still likely to trade uh, these levels around the 21 area over the next couple of weeks. This is a monthly chart of uh, silver SLV. Um, and it keeps on, you know, it, it keeps on failing to uh, hold this 2105 to 2045 um, area. Um, I mean, it's holding it, but it's holding it by the skin of its teeth. I still think it's likely to have a flush down into the, you know, 19s, uh, maybe 18s, this kind of level around uh, 1840. Uh, and that is what, that's another reason why I think that gold is going to have one last flush down uh, towards the 1700, maybe into the mid 1600s. Um, you know, a quick 10% down in silver, um, and then that probably will be the bottom. Uh, you know, the when people finally realize that inflation is not 6%, but it's actually 2 to 2.5%, two there has to be a consequence to that. And it has to be that these uh, very much uh, inflated uh, assets like silver get dumped, and that is the bottom. I want to start the uh, equities part with some charts that I might not have shown you before. This one is VTI over SPY, VTI being the totality of the stock market against SPY. It is very clear what is happening here. The totality of the stock market is rising uh, at a much, much slower rate this year than SPX. SPX being a weighted index, it's weighted towards the largest companies, uh, you know, things like um, Apple, Google, Facebook, etc. have a very disproportional effect on the price of SPY compared to the totality of the uh, stock market, even in the US. Um, and you can see what is happening uh, all year, basically, and this is uh, 2021. We started the year here. Uh, we went a little bit higher and then we reversed. And basically all year long, we're going back down towards the lows. You can see what happened during the, uh, uh, the panic. Uh, these levels are where SPY belongs, basically. This is where we have been for a very long time. So what SPY has done is returned and retaken the primacy. Uh, that can be set, seen from several spreads, uh, including uh, the ones that I'm going to show next. This is SPY over IWM, basically the Russell. And you can see how uh, we are basically going uh, back to levels where we were during the coronavirus period. Um, what is that saying? Well, basically saying that people are concentrating their holdings into the upper echelon of IE quality. Um, it, is, um, it is what it is. Um, this is, a, I guess, a massive uh, you know, rounded bottom. And you can see how far we came uh, from the year 2000. And, you know, it, it, it just seems to me that every time it dips, there are buyers in this spread uh, and it moves then much harder to, on the way up. That to me says that the 
Russell uh, and second tier stocks and so on are still to be avoided. Uh, this is a spread move. This is a spread move of the biggest uh, and best stocks which are concentrated in the SPX. Uh, you're talking your Apples, your Googles, etc., etc., And those are the stocks that are holding up the index. Only when those stocks give up will the, will the SPX be able to come back. Um, it, is, it is what it is. Um, there is method in their madness, i.e. those are the stocks which are going to uh, be uh, most affected by stability in the bonds. If you have companies which are extremely profitable, uh, like Apple, uh, they are going to remain very well bid if the long bond doesn't move too far away from 2%. Uh, they're going to equalize the yield between treasuries and, uh, and those stocks and everything else which is not generating profits um, you know it is just not going to be as bid those uh, those multiples are going to come down you can see exactly what I'm saying by the uh, Blue Angels the expectations keep on rising um, and if they keep on rising unless we get lower multiples the index can only go higher um, are we the only way we're going to get lower multiples is via much higher levels of uh, terminal interest rates uh, i.e. way over 2% in the uh, long bond if that doesn't happen we're going to remain in this area between where we've been all this time between 20 and 22 and as the uh, line rises so does the market with it it's as simple as that uh, the second and third tier stocks uh, the stuff that has no profits is getting dumped for the safety of this paradigm i.e basically as we go up in the earnings forward earnings expectations of the big stocks that have huge profits so the market rises with it and these charts illustrate why bond rates are not going to go a million miles. This is the five-year, five-year forward inflation expectation rate, which is what uh, Jay Powell likes to look at. Uh, <clears throat> look how basically it is at the same level that it has been since 2018, uh, 20 was this 2017 2018 we are at the same level as we were then that is why i don't think the fed is going to be hugely hawkish next uh, uh, this week <clears throat> because it doesn't need to be hugely hawkish the market is telling him that we are most probably past peak inflation he can just do what the forward curve implies i.e two three hikes next year um, or and that will be the end of the tightening cycle if that is the end of the tightening cycle bond markets are not going to be, move a million miles to the upside the same can be said for this year which is 10-year break-even inflation rate the inflation rate that they're showing is around the 2.4 2.5 area um, j powell likes that very much too and if we enlarge that, well, where are we? We are in the same level we were in 2011, 2012, 2013. So why should, uh, what basically what the market is saying, if the Fed does two, three hikes, does a bit of QT, uh, we, are, we are golden. That is what the bond market is saying and the stock market is listening to them saying right if that's the case uh, who has the profits who's generating the profits what will the profits growth be we can maintain the multiplier and therefore just follow those fe curves slightly higher in the spx everything else which does not have profits we're going to dump 
and put our money there. This is a chart of ACWI, which basically is the world against SPY. You know, it, it doesn't need much commenting. We are in a very, uh, very much a downtrend. This very much suggests that we will continue to have the US as a leader in equities, i.e. SPY, the SPY section of it as a leader. That Will there be slight bumps here? Yes. But this is saying basically the United States uh, asset prices in the US will continue to lead. The quality in the US will continue to lead the world in price appreciation. Having said all that, let's go to SP, what, SPX. On Friday, broke this very, very significant level. You can see how uh, 4703, 4704, uh, previous high close uh, in on you know before we got the dip, and basically now it's you know it, it's very hard to be bearish of it. The fact that it's left a breakaway gap, I mean, so what? Um, it, it really could never close below uh, 4538. Uh, it, it this was you know basically as soon as the market opened, it just started going higher, and that was it. It never stopped. If we have a look on a weekly chart. Um, you know, every time it breaks the, the weekly Bollinger Bands, it comes back and it goes back up. Uh, the weekly Bollinger Bands are now going up at about 25 uh, a week, which gives us around 47.60 as the high resistance in the Bollinger Bands next week. SPX is not the index to short, it's not the index to hedge with. Compare and contrast what SPX is doing, i.e. making new highs, compared to what the IWM is doing, i.e. the Russell. Um, look, this is the weekly move in the Russell. Okay, It had four very strong down weeks and this pathetic little bounce overall. Uh, in, you know, this is, the market is supported down here. It, I very much doubt it breaks 210 any time soon. But what does that say about the market? It basically says that uh, since the spread between IWM and XPX is, is going higher, uh, this market is going to trade in this range and every time the S&P drops, it's going to get bought. Uh, if this market can't go much lower, then XPX is going to slowly grind higher on a spread. And that is what's happening. And that's why I just can't get bullish of IWM. Uh, I don't see any point. If I need to hedge something, I hedge it with IWM rather than with, with SPX. NQ is basically a tale of two cities. I, I, I said a while ago that I just cannot move away my own positions, my own composition away from SPX. Um, you know, I, I go to the, I try to hug the index of SPX as much as possible. Why? Because NDX is a tale of two cities. It's the tale of uh, Apple, Google, and so on, but also of all the other um, companies which are high growth and have no profits. The market is punishing them hugely and rewarding the Apples and the Googles. But what that does is basically makes NDX go nowhere. Uh, is NDX going to go down? Very much doubted. It's only going to go down if and when the um, the uh, the Apples of this world start giving up some and they will. And that is why I just can't get bullish of NDX either. I think NDX is in a range and will remain in a range until the high growth stocks have done going down. But I think that there is still a very good possibility that we get a 
proper dump in some high growth stocks. And this is why I think that we can have a proper dump. Um, this is ARKK and you can see the uh, basically we're doing an ABC kind of retracement and really that is targeting the 70 area. Contrast, I mean, what has happened, it, it basically what has happened in ARK and I can enlarge this is exactly what is happening in the uh, second and third tier stocks. We had this huge dump Okay, we had a dead cat bounce to the first moving averages. Boom, we cannot hold. Uh, to me, ARKK will make new lows and will continue to make new lows towards the uh, 70s. Um, and if that happens, we will uh, we'll inevitably have that reflected in the... Um, uh, in the indices, but SPY will be the one, SPX, SPY will be the ones which are least affected. Uh, and really the, these individual uh, uh, high growth ETFs are the ones that are going to get smashed. And, you know, sort of Russell will be on its lows and on support and so on. Uh, yes, there will be dips in SPY. But SBY is not the one to sell. What I'm trying to say can really best be seen in these charts. This is NDX, so the totality of the um, of the uh, Nasdaq 100 against the SPY, and that is not breaking the highs. And this is XLK over SPY, and this is a goner. Uh, why? Because XLK is basically Apple, Google, Facebook, etc. So, as you can see, this is the difference. The, it's, the difference is in the unprofitable, high growth, high multiple uh, beta stocks that are in the NDX. Um, and those are the ones that ARK has, basically. And those are the ones that I think will continue to get smashed while XLK, completely different story. You can't confuse at the moment NDX and XLK. At some stage, those stocks will be cheap enough, you know, give them another 15%, <clears throat> whatever it is. They achieve their target towards the 70, 75 level in ARC, as I showed you earlier, and this will go as well. But in the meantime, there's a big differential between things which make excellent profits and things which are only high growth. The rest of the world is doing very, very little. Uh, you know, this is Europe and basically we are not making new highs. We are nowhere near making new highs. Uh, it just shows you DAX same thing you know we go up and we fade back down to the moving averages here we go up and we fade to the moving averages everything else that one looks at if we go and have a look at Nikkei same thing up fade everything else is much much weaker than SPX and that is what the market is saying the market is saying stick to the US for your assets and while that is going on, it's very hard to get bearish of the um, of US dollars. Um, and the key, and I've been saying this to you for a long time, unless bond prices go much, much lower, SPX is going to be supported at whatever the support level is. Yes, it's going to have swoons, but it's not the one to hedge with. It's not the one to be short of. I have updated all the levels. Uh, I really don't think much is going to happen next week. I think that there's going to be definite disappointment by the ultra hawks. Um, I just can't see uh, any reason, as I've showed you from those charts of the 10-year break-even inflation rates and the five-year, five-year forwards, I, inflation, I just can't see any reason for them to be ultra, ultra, 
uh, hawkish. I can see a reason to follow the market and say, yes, we're going to taper slightly faster, but I think it's going to leave enough leeway on either side, given this Omicron and uncertainty, uh, that the bond markets do not take fright. And the only way I can see SPX going down is if the bond markets take fright and that when and we lower the multiples uh, on the uh, on the FEs, as I showed you in <clears throat> the on the Blue Angels. If that doesn't happen, and I don't think it will, then SPX is going to hold steady uh, while everything else in the high growth areas can get smashed and continue to get smashed. That should keep the indices within reasonable levels uh, and tolerable swings for next week. I really would avoid those ARC stocks for the next few months. Thank you very much indeed and tweet you on Monday.